the early bird gets the worm. The worm is then digested and converted into more bird matter in what we like to call trophic effects. Today, in this lecture, we are going to talk about the production efficiency and trophic level transfer efficiency, as well as various trophic levels, biomass, bottom-up, top-down effects, community relationships, and energy budgets in an ecosystem. And we're going to start this with a discussion about sustainability. What is the best thing to eat for the environment? Well, many people would say it would be to go vegetarian. And, well, yes. So, for every 100 kilograms of grain, you can have a cow produce 10 kilograms of beef. For every 100 kilograms of grain, you can have a human produce 10 kilograms of human. This is the idea between tr about trophic efficiency, is living at a lower trophic level means there's more energy available because as energy has to pass through each trophic level, it's going to lose a certain amount in heat and metabolism. We're also looking here at a cow and a chicken. Now these are very different organisms. What's happening here is a chicken actually is going to produce more chicken meat then a cow produces beef per unit grain because these organisms have different production efficiencies. This also gets to the question of why we don't eat and raise and eat uh, predators, high trophic level creatures, for ourselves to eat is because if you had 10, 100 kilograms of grain, makes 10 kilograms of cow, would make one kilogram of wolf, and then that would lead to 0.1 kilogram of human eating wolf, so 100 kilograms of grain going all the way down and funneling into that very narrow amount of uh, human. So this is one reason that it's actually more efficient for, the, for our sake as a species living on this planet to feed on a lower trophic level. Now let's get to the mechanics of this. We're going to start this off with production efficiency. So let's take a growing organism. Now, this is, remember, this is taking a growing organism. If we take an organism like, well, most of us, so I just had uh, some fruit cake and it was, uh, it was delicious, and I'm going to convert that into the energy of making lectures. I'm not going to be using that fruit cake to increase my biomass. But let's just say we're taking a growing organism here. Maybe it's a young caterpillar or a, a tiny squirrel kitten. Yes, called kittens. If a caterpillar is going to be feeding on a uh, 100 grams, it's a lot of food, but of leaf, about 30%, 32% of that is going to be used in metabolism, detoxifying the leaves, um, keeping the caterpillar moving and such. About 50% of that biomass is going to be lost in feces. The food they eat is uh, ecologically, it has an ecological stoichiometry that is pretty far away from the caterpillar. So a lot of stuff just gets passed on. About 18% of that is going to be growth then. So 32% metabolism, 50% feces, and then that leaves 18% for, for growth, for growing the caterpillar. So not incredibly efficient, but at the same time, it's doing what it can. Compare that to a squirrel eating some, uh, eating some nuts or some sunflower seeds, about 80% of that you use or more in metabolism. Remember, squirrels are endothermic, so they're going to have to burn a lot of calories to keep themselves warm. 17% is lost in feces. If they're eating nuts and sunflower seeds, those are higher in lipids and proteins, and thus the ecological stoichiometry is a little closer to the actual squirrel. So remember as well, squirrels do eat bird eggs and will eat meat if they can. And about 1.6% that's going to be used in growth. Now the difference here between caterpillars and squirrels is the ectothermy versus endothermy, the amount of metabolism that they have to use just to stay um, warm and alive. So that's going to have a huge change in production efficiency. How much, how many calories are used for staying warm versus how many calories are used for actual growth. Now, if we were to take the whole trophic level as a gestalt and view it, you know, as a whole, we get what we call is called trophic efficiency. Now look at the squirrel as a non-predator, and what you see is that both squirrels and caterpillars exist on that uh, first um, consumer trophic level. They're primary consumers. 
So trophic level efficiency is, uh, if you were to think about all the primary consumers divided by all of the producers, so that's the net productivity at trophic level N, i.e. the amount of biomass, or amount of energy present there, and the production at trophic level N minus one, which is the energy present at uh, the leaves and nuts variety, and multiply that by 100, you'll get the trophic efficiency. Now, trophic efficiency is almost always less than production efficiency because not everything is being eaten. So a caterpillar doesn't eat stems. A squirrel doesn't eat shells. These are some things that the trophic efficiency kind of has to take into account that you wouldn't think of so much with production efficiency. A squirrel will eat a gram of nut and will leave, you know, 20 milligrams of shell. And that's going to be um, your lack of production efficiency moving up to the next term. So that's meaning trophic efficiency as a whole is generally pretty low. So you think about how much grass will support 10 kilograms of zebra and how many kilograms of zebra will support how many kilograms of lion. So that's going to be your um, your trophic efficiency. The zebra doesn't eat the roots of the grass and the lion doesn't eat the bones of the zebra. So that's going to be a lower production efficiency right off the bat. Now this is going to yield uh, a certain type of community structure. So Oh, actually, all the way up. How much biomass is available at the first trophic level? How much biomass, how much productivity is happening in the primary production way down in the phytoplankton? That's actually going to be able to dictate how many different trophic levels we see. Now look at the bottom graph down there, and you'll see we've got a terrestrial food chain there. We've got some plant, and that plant is your producer. I don't, it's primary producers. There are no secondary producers, okay? So it's just producers. And then your herbivore is your primary consumer, your carnivore being your secondary consumer, another carnivore being your tertiary consumer, and then, if possible, another carnivore being your quaternary consumer. It doesn't really get to quinternary uh, very easily. So that's your terrestrial food chain. We're saying food chain because we're just looking at, like, say, a single molecule passing through things. A single molecule of, uh, of sugar passing through a plant and herbivore, oh, probably protein, okay. A single molecule of protein passing through a plant, herbivore, carnivore, 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 going all the way up there, that's going to be on a chain. But you're going to have a food web when you're actually looking at this diversity within a trophic level. So here we have this um, aquatic food web. You've got phytoplankton that can be eaten by krill, that can be eaten by copepods. Now krill can go straight to the baleen whales. And that's going to be your second, your secondary consumer. But krill can also go to carnivorous plankton as a secondary consumer. Carnivorous plankton can be eaten by a squid which is your uh, tertiary consumer. Now that squid can be eaten by an elephant seal, which is your quaternary consumer. And the elephant seal can be eaten by a smaller toothed whale. So that's your quintenary consumer. And you see that kind of move up. That would be a food chain with multiple, with more links. And it just depends on what's eating the krill, whether you have a food chain with two links or a food chain with five links. Now, I really take exception to this uh, aquatic graph. Humans don't eat baleen whales and sperm whales and elephant seals really that much anymore. So I'm gonna put something, uh, something on the top there. We'll put Cthulhu. We'll put Cthulhu at the top. You know the great old ones eat whatever they want. So there we have it. I've solved your problem. The apex predator there is gonna eat everything else. But you see this as two ways. A food web where you have squid eating fish and fish eating squid and elephant seals eating squid and leopard seals eating fish or squid, multiple different ways to move through this web, and a food chain, a much more simplified version of tracking a molecule as it moves through. So let's take a look at some um, food chains and the what we're going to call bottom-up effects. So you've got a primary producer. Here we have, um, looks like, a, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name here. It, it's primrose. There you go. So primrose, and that primrose is being eaten by aphids. Now the aphids can be eaten by many different predator species, which is going to be your 
um, depending on what's actually going up the food chain, it can be eaten by aphids or, I'm sorry, um, ladybugs or various uh, wasps or other predators. Uh, ants are a mutualist with the aphid as well, so we have that kind of a food web going on. And if we were to introduce uh, a higher amount of fertilizer or a higher amount of um, leaves down at the primary producer level, what's going to happen is we're going to impact the whole food chain. More plants available. Let's say we fertilize the primrose. We fertilize this primrose, and that's going to mean there's more aphids. When there are more aphids, there can be more ladybugs. And that's what's called a bottom-up effect, increasing the productivity at the bottom of the food chain increases every link in that chain. Each link of that chain gets bigger. So the amount of uh, the per capita aphid growth rate is going to be increasing when you have more leaf water content. So if I were to water these primroses, that's going to increase their photosynthesis and thus increase the number of aphids, which will increase the number of wasps feeding on those aphids. Anything that starts at the bottom and increases productivity will increase every other link of that food chain. There's also something called top-down regulation. So if I introduce a predator, let's say I've got a food web in the lake. There's phytoplankton being eaten by zooplankton, being eaten by planktivorous fish. And I introduce that bass because I'm all about that bass, about that bass, no sunfish. That bass is going to be a plus minus effect on planktivorous fish. Plus for the bass, bad for the planktivorous fish. When there are fewer planktivorous fish, there will be more herbivorous zooplankton. When there are more herbivorous zooplankton, there'll be fewer large phytoplankton. Mm. So a top-down effect is going to be minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So while a bottom-up is plus, 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 a top-down is going to be minus, plus, minus, plus, depending on how many different trophic levels there are. Introducing a quinternary carnivore that only feeds on quaternary carnivores is going to decrease the quaternary, increase the tertiary, decrease the secondary, and increase the primary herbivores, which is going to then decrease the amount of plant material. So yeah, top-down regulation is complex until you just really think it's a plus minus plus minus because predators are plus minus. So if we added more large phytoplankton though, that's a bottom-up effect. More zooplankton, more planktivorous fish, more bats. What if I introduce more zooplankton? Well, then we're going to have more planktivorous fish and more bats, but fewer phytoplankton. So really, this trophic cascade depends on what's below and what's above. And just really think about it in terms of predation. They actually did this whole experiment where they, uh, I mean, take, take it to the proof as far as what's called a trophic cascade. They introduced bass, and what they saw is, well, pretty much exactly what I said. The piscivore biomass um, was increased. That means the planktivore biomass was decreased. So you see those little fish. The little fishies go down the more big fishies I added. Okay. Uh, the more big fishies I added, the more you will actually see an increase in the herbivores and, of course, a decrease in the um, plankton because you have increased herbivores. So kind of proof of concept of what's called a trophic cascade, that plus, minus, plus, minus all the way down. Now, we also can see a variation in primary productivity. This is kind of an interesting thing. It's not always so simple. Oh, I hate it when he says that. Um, let's say we take herbivores and we add them to a system. High intensity grazing will make low production. Okay, we keep the cows in the pasture too long. They're going to mow everything. They're going to moo everything down. They eat everything. But low intensity grazing is also associated with low production. The grass overgrows things and dead leaf tissue will prevent new leaves from coming up. Much like the intermediate disturbance, but for slightly different reasons, areas grazed at medium intensity have the highest primary productivity. What's going on here is something called compensatory growth. Let's say you have some grasses, and I'm using grasses as an example because they have their apical meristem below ground. So a cow comes along and grazes the grass. Well, the grass will then reallocate nutrients from its roots to more leaves. And not only will it reallocate nutrients from roots to shoots, but this reallocation is because 
there's now less, um, less draw from the leaves to pull up water. So the roots really are not needed because it is balancing out its um, evapotranspiration rate with its root metabolism rate. Remember, roots are metabol metabolically active and highly metabolically active roots means it needs more photosynthate. And if for a smaller plant, can't produce as much photosynthase, so it makes sense for the plant really to just balance this out in compensatory growth. Now, on the addition to that, since it's been grazed, there's no shade. So it's able to photosynthesize at a higher efficiency because there's no shade. So it grows even faster than it normally would. Now, it's going to do that compensatory growth, and that's going to increase the primary productivity because you've got um, more photosynthesis and really less draw on the water table if everything has been grazed. And this is kind of the organismal biology reason for compensatory growth. But this also is going to increase the total primary productivity of the ecosystem if there's moderate grazing. Do not get on my computer, you kitten. Don't. No, don't. I've got a, a carnivore right here staring at my computer and hopefully not going to walk across the keyboard. Anyway, we also think about this in terms of biodiversity. So when the cows graze the grasses, they may not eat as much of certain herbs. And those herbs can now be, eat, can now be growing faster. And when they're growing faster, they can be eaten by their aphids, their beetles, or whatnot. So the role of biodiversity here is to increase the stability of ecosystems by always having something ready as primary productivity, even if another species has a bad year or goes extinct. Oh boy, this is a complex picture, but it's actually quite pretty. And this is where I kind of wish I had it like broadly up there, because we're going to look at this uh, ecosystem structure. So this ecosystem structure, you start with your solar radiation coming in. So that's a finite amount of energy given by how much sunlight goes through the clouds and reaches land, if we're talking about a terrestrial ecosystem. So start that, that is 100% of the total available energy. How much of that is reflected? Well, in this case, we have about 15% is just reflected because, uh, you know, plants reflect light. Otherwise, the earth would be black. Um, it's green because green light is going to be reflected. Okay, a certain amount of that sunlight is going to hit and is going to turn into heat. It's going to either warm up the plants or... The plants are going to metabolize that sunlight after photosynthesis and actually release heat. Cat. Um, plants, plants release heat. Cats release heat too when they metabolize the things that they have eaten. That's going to be released from the ecosystem. So about 41% of that solar radiation is going to be released as heat. Now, evapotranspiration is actually going to be causing a certain amount of uh, energy to be released. Remember, not just heat but energy flowing out and warming up the, um, the water molecules, increasing evapotranspiration. So not just raw heat, but also evaporation. All right, then that's going to leave, uh, so 100%, minus 15%, minus 41%, minus 42%. You notice that not a lot of this is going in as actual photosynthesis. So really about like, you know, 12% of this is going in as actual photosynthesis. And then to make matters worse, plants use some of it for respiration. So the amount of carbon that's turned into something and then broken down, that's energy besides heat. So you're going to also have the energy given off just by chemical reactions besides heat. So 1.2% of the solar radiation is lost as plant respiration. It really doesn't leave a lot. So your total plant production being, you know, 2.2% after a certain amount of organic biomass being made. Okay, so you got the net primary productivity, productivity down at the bottom there. Cover that in another lecture. Net primary productivity is really about, we're given 1% of your solar radiation. Okay. Above ground storage, 0.2%. That's how much is going to be staying in the plants. Um, grazing the food, the grazing food web, then you have the uh, ingestion by consumers, 0.01%. Uh, root biomass is your 2.4% of what? Of that, of that 1%. That's uh, a little more complicated and ugly than I don't want it to be. Your grazing consumer respiration, your detritus respiration, your uh, stream consumer biomass of what's going to be going into the stream, how much is going to be, yeah, basically you're, you're looking at most energy isn't making it down. So I'm looking at the numbers. The more I look at the numbers, the less, the less they really add up well. But 
the real theme of this, most energy is given off reflected heat, evapotranspiration, then if plants actually fix carbon with the energy, it's respiration or turning into biomass that then can't be used. Most energy stops at the plant. Well, stop. Most energy stops before becoming available to the next trophic level. And we're going to look at primary productivity and how that affects secondary productivity and how that affects a whole ecosystem in a later lecture. But right now, let's look at how we can see that in what's called the kind of pyramid of numbers. We're going to come back to this later on, but I want to kind of give a, give a preview. You have a primary productivity for dry mass. We can just measure how much is present at any given moment as a measure of how energy is moving through. So look at how is energy moving through these trophic levels. Well, very little is going down or up the trophic levels. Most of it is staying in the primary product producers at any given unit time. And part of that goes back to production efficiency. There are a lot of organisms out there that simply don't eat wood. So a lot of that is just staying in lignin. Aquatically, there isn't wood in the ocean. So what you actually get is this phytoplankton is often uh, devoured pretty quickly and you don't get a, as much of an accumulation in biomass. I want to come back to that in a future lecture, but I want you to think of this. If you're going into marine bio, how energy is transient in the phytoplankton and moves quickly into zooplankton so that aquatic ecosystems will actually have um, an inverted pyramid. It's kind of something cool to think about if you're thinking about um, aquatic biology and how that affects, uh, how trophic levels affect that.